Hi everyone and welcome to your last panel of the day and the last of the SDG topics and that is good health and well-being. Um, I'm so excited to be discussing this and discussing the importance of securing good health and well-being and making sure that nobody gets left behind while achieving this goal. We'll be discussing how innovation and technology can help support this and how we can achieve information testing and insurance for all. So I'd love to welcome the brilliant panel that I have with me today and I'll just introduce them briefly and then give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. So we've got Amy Lin, who is the Acting Director at USAID Center for Innovation and Impact. We've got Christopher Gandrup Marino, who is the Chief of Innovation at UNICEF, and Ibele Mogo, who is the who is a research consultant at the World Health Organization. I'll leave it to you guys to introduce yourselves. Maybe if we start with Amy. Hi, thank you, Noor, and I'm glad you saved the best for last. I'm thrilled to be here on this panel today. As you mentioned, my name is Amy Lin. I lead the Center for Innovation and Impact at USAID. We focus on innovation and market access and digital health and how those can be crucial approaches to accomplishing um, our goals in the global health space. Um, we work by incubating new ideas, putting them into practice, and scaling them with partnerships. And look forward to sharing more about that today. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Christopher? and happy to be part of this panel. Um, so I'm Chief of Innovation at UNICEF, leading um, what's called product innovation, which is about driving R&D and scale of new innovative products that we can uh, use to improve the, the lives of children throughout the globe. Um, so this is really innovation across the board and the different products we procure. Um, and it's about leveraging uh, our role as a procure. We procure, procure for five between five and six billion USD a year as well as our role in implementing these technologies in countries um, in sort of building on the role we have as a trusted advisor to governments. Then I also have another uh, role, which is participating in a number of boards uh, of impact venture capital funds, which is then more on the, the supply side of things. So this is about investing in companies that can develop products that can improve the lives of kids. Um, so I see the, the world of improving the lives of lives of kids uh, through innovation through uh, uh, two different lenses. Brilliant. Welcome. And Ibele? Hello, everyone. And nice to meet you, Amy, Christopher, and to see you again, Noor. So my name is Ibele Mogo. I'm a doc public health doctor. And a lot of my work focuses on kind of linking research with innovation to address public health challenges. I wear a couple of hats as well. So I kind of wear the research hat where I look at how to think of how to, um, kind of evidence around what works and how to use that to implement interventions. I wear a policy hat where we kind of look at how we can use what we find from research to shape policy around um, um, supporting innovations that improve health. And I've also, I also wear the kind of private sector startup hat where I've done a lot of work around deploying and building partnerships to, um, to implement innovations that address particularly access to healthcare. Um, so yeah, I look forward to having this conversation, which I think is quite uh, going to be interesting. Yeah, I think it will be great. And thank you again for joining us. So I will go straight into my first question. And this is something that we've been talking about or starting our panels with, uh, with a lot of these SDG topics. I think it's important to kind of define what we mean when we talk about uh, good health and well-being, and especially in the context of each of your experiences, which you've just spoken about. I'd love to know how you think of good health and well-being and really what, what do you mean when you talk about uh, good health and well-being? And Amy, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I'm happy to. I think it's such an important question to ground ourselves in what the goal is, what we are all striving for. Um, I think when we commonly think about health and well-being, it's very easy to rely on clinical indicators, and those are really important. But I, a broader definition of how we consider it is also what people want and not just what they need. And so how do we think about health interventions, health products that speak to uh, their um, to, that speak to ways that they want to use those health products and services and not just feel that they should. So for example, one way that we've been looking at this is using human-centered design to um, consider how to increase the interest and demand for oral PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. So you can take a pill every day to lower your risk of contracting HIV, but it's not an easy sell for adolescent girls and young women in sub-Saharan Africa who are most at risk to think about a stigmatized disease and, and to be reminded of it every day by taking a pill. Instead, how can we reframe it 
as part of their beauty regimen, to think about their daily rituals to, um, to prepare themselves for the day. And we've worked with human-centered designers and global health experts and the young women themselves in different co-creation workshops to look at a new approach called V. And one flagship um, indicator of this or mark of this is actually a new type of pill case. So instead of looking like a bottle that rattles and indicates there are pills inside, it looks like a lip balm case, a beauty product with dividers for each pill. So they don't rattle, they don't make a noise. And if they're seen in your purse, they look like they fit right in with any other makeup or beauty products that you might have. Brilliant. I love that reframing of how we're thinking of it and really integrating it into daily life. Um, Christopher, how do you think of good health and well-being? Well, so I agree with everything Amy is saying. Um, UNICEF does work to improve uh, the lives, especially of those that are first down the equity scale. Um, so it's really uh, as a standard about working with those that, that have access to very little. And in particular, we try to address that by working through the government in these areas. Um, so for us, it's often about ensuring that there's access to very basic health interventions uh, in, in get up, uh, get, getting better health. Um, there's a lot of debates around how to best access this and how to best improve these matters. Um, and I think some of the things that Amy is raising in terms of ensuring that it isn't just a government mandated health uh, activity to do that, but you also fully, uh, to the degree possible, respect the agency of the people we're trying to help is pivotal because otherwise the effort to, to drive things forward um, uh, is, is, is tough. It's really tough. And I think some of the, the things we're seeing, which is maybe more uh, something I'm seeing with my venture capital head on in terms of ensuring that people have access to their own data, variables, all these kind of things that makes people better aware of the health situation they're in and what they can do and what they can get access to is some of the things that will help drive progress and also in turn make, in turn make them uh, demand these services for governments and uh, sort of making everything add up. Great, thank you. And Ibele, how do you think of it? Awesome. Um, building on kind of what my co-panelists have said, um, I, I, I think of health and well-being as multifaceted. And I think that there's different components that comprise the person's, the picture of their health in a sense. So on one level, we can think of the outcomes that we're trying to address, whether it's death or disease, injury. Um, and then we'll think about what kind of maybe individual and social factors are driving that. So we will think about, for example, how we're talking about how do we get people to change behaviors? How do we recognize their agency? Do they have social support for them to sustain that behavior change? And then we'll also think about access to maybe healthcare, particularly pre primary and preventative healthcare. So is this healthcare of a good quality? Is it affordable? But I think something that's often left out as well is access to um, health promoting environments. So a lot of the work I do looks at chronic diseases, for example, especially in like rapidly urbanizing cities in Africa and the Caribbean. And so, for example, if you want people to sustain behavior change around healthy eating, do they have access to healthy food? Can they store this food um, safely if they're living in a slum? If we want people to engage in physical activity, um, can they even walk? Is it safe for them to walk? If they're walking, are they also exposing themselves to pollution, which is also complicating their risk for like another chronic disease? So these are kind of the different factors that we have to consider if we're thinking about sustainably improving health and well-being. Brilliant. Yeah. So integrating it again into, into so many other aspects. And I think that's something that we're realizing as we discuss these SDGs in the other panels as well as how interlinked they all are with each other. More. Um, so that, Can I build on what uh, Dr. Abelli just think. mentioned? I, it really struck me what she was saying about beyond the clinic walls, and I, I couldn't agree more. I love thinking about zooming out a little bit and not thinking about health only limited to the health system officially, but also to all of the factors in a client or patient's life that affects their health. Um, so I just wanted to extend that thought a little bit further. Sometimes we measure health by one point in time. What is your blood pressure in that moment? What is your cholesterol in that moment? But really health and wellness are over a lifetime. And so how do we think about it longitudinally and um, well-being in a, in, a, in a longer time frame? And then also about their experience interacting with the health system. So how are they treated? Um, are they treated with respect and dignity? Do they have short wait times? Is it convenient and easy for them to access health services? So I, I really liked that idea of um, zooming out and really considering all of the different factors that, um, that matter to patients about their own quality of living 
as well as the clinical indicators. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing around value-based care is trying to understand that as well as what type of metrics do we use? How do we track them over time? And how do we consider issues beyond the clinic walls? Uh, and then hopefully after measuring, incentivize and, and make those changes to better achieve health and, and wellness and, and quality of life uh, for our, our communities that we care about. Brilliant. Thank you for expanding on that. And I think definitely, yeah, we need to be lo looking at it on a much wider um, basis. And I think that brings me on to my second question. And obviously, we're thinking about our audience today who are looking at innovating in this area and and, um, and reevaluating um, good health. And so I want to ask you all what what makes a good innovation in this space? So what sort of thing um, are we looking for? And maybe some advice to our, um, our audience. Um, maybe Christopher, if you could start. Yes. So linking this question to the discussion we just had, I think for, for us as innovators in, in these spaces, it's often a, a dilemma between ensuring that there is access to the most basic health interventions. So someone like UNICEF works to support kids um, where, you know, the, the mortality rates in these environments is extremely high or we have a lot of a, a focus these years on, on disabilities. Where, where kids are treated horrendously in some of these environments. So ensuring that there's the basic access to vaccines, that they're treated with some level of dignity if they're disabled, et cetera, et cetera, is pivotal. And yet then often when we look at innovation, they're sort of trying to, to go beyond this and saying, okay, we are, we know we have to respect um, and have to ensure that there's appropriate resources to ensure kids are vaccinated, et cetera. But we also want to pioneer ahead in other areas. Fundamentally, um, the one of the key issues we are focusing on these days in order to progress with innovation is that whatever we push forward has a really strong value proposition. So whether you add, address it from an equity perspective or, or something else, you have to understand that in these environments, resources are scarce. And there's a big risk that they are all being approached by a lot of salespeople with fancy interventions. Um, and we are trying to, to use our role in being a trusted advisor to government to ensure that only those interventions with a really strong value proposition are pushed through. And that's considering all these many dimensions we're talking about. Um, it's tough because you're comparing pears and apples across the board. Um, and very often the, the big difficulties in implementation. So I like to say that, you know, I'm responsible for, pro for product innovation, but that for any successful product innovation, there's 5% product and 95% programming or implementation. So ensuring that something is successful is very much about ensuring that you work through all these many challenges down the line, respecting that, you know, the ideas are dime a dozen and having fancy technologies really doesn't cut it much. So, so having this full orientation when you progress on things and select what to work with and what not to work with is critical. We try to do it in an agile approach. Um, so to, to have that orientation towards that, well, we need to select critically which projects we work on up front, but then we have to understand that all throughout those stages of development, you have to, to look at the innovation at the project with a critical lens. And it's our moral obligation to stop those projects that do not have that potential to deliver that, uh, that intervention with a, 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 a strong value proposition. So we really try to have good, strong gating systems in place um, in making sure um, that you only progress the, the best of the best. You need to have a highest level of scrutiny in this environment than anywhere else. And, and when we then have the interventions, like, for example, the, the plant in a box innovation we are rolling out right now to address oxygen, they can move quickly. Um, so we've seen a number of issues or a new innovative tent uh, that came online about a year ago. Uh, they can move quickly. But it's, it's, you know, in order to get there, they've gone a long journey and, and it's one out of a thousand that, that succeeds. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing. Amy, uh, Bele, do you have anything to add or any even examples in your work as well of, sort of what makes a good innovation? Yes. Dr. Bele, did you want to go first? Okay, sure. Um, I, I really like um, this lens of thinking about um, sort of that difference between inventing as in coming up with something new and innovation as the way we apply to actually solve a problem. So in this case, health. And I think the, the key thing for, um, for good innovation, for, uh, I'd say, is that really connecting that business case with an impact case. Because when it comes to health, you can actually have a solution that has a business case, but may not necessarily be making the impact that you set out to make. And I think to do that, we look at two elements. We look at sort of how it's being designed, right? Is it designed based on best practices, designed based on evidence? 
is it designed based on a kind of a theory of change that could work? And are we testing it to see if it works? Um, but there's also the question of access. So especially around this theme of leaving no one behind, um, are we really addressing people that have the big burdens and bar um, barriers? Because oftentimes in emerging economies, it's very easy to kind of segment the market and focus on people who already have the means, kind of the people who already, you know, higher socioeconomic classes. So if we're thinking about leaving no one behind, the question is also going to be, how are we going to address the burdens and barriers? And I think that often has to do with a lot of partnerships, partnerships with governments, nonprofits, communities, thinking about oftentimes enabling infrastructure. So a lot of the work that I've done around digital health, you know, you might notice that in a particular part of town, let's say you have a, a, a tool that maybe works somewhere else, but actually people don't in the first place have electricity or they don't have access to internet um, or the staff haven't been trained that they don't really know how to use this technology. So really thinking about interventions holistically, I like um, what Christopher said about how it's like 5% product and then programming. So I think really that you know, um, is taking it a step further between kind of having an idea and then really thinking critically about how to use it to solve um, the health problems and for the people that have the big burdens. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that. I think um, we, we must work in the same field because there's a lot of alignment here. Um, <laughs> I think uh, a, a good innovation is certainly one that has a good impact case and a business case, as Dr. Belli was saying, and fully agree with the 95-5 ratio that Christopher was just noting as well. To me, it's an innovation that works and also keeps working. I think there are also many examples of innovations that are wonderful on day one, but are not in use on day 30 or, or day 60 or day 90. But really the impact is generated if it's ongoing uh, function um, functionality can continue. So one example that we've been really impressed by is Gradian Health Systems. Um, and they have this universal anesthesia machine that can work without reliable access to electricity. So just as Dr. Belly was saying, in rugged environments um, under, under different types of constraints. And it um, doesn't even need, um, it can use room air to provide oxygen as needed. It's in use in a thousand facilities in over 25 low and middle income countries. But it's not just the fact that it was able to deliver these anesthesia machines, it's that they're still working today, months and years after they're working, after they were delivered. They have a three-year warranty, and they are able to offer that in part because they have distributed hubs for local maintenance and repair so that you can have quick access to spare parts, to expertise. You can WhatsApp your questions, and you can make sure that they continue to function um, after, they've, after they've arrived. And the other uh, piece they offer is training. And um, I think, Dr. Bell, you mentioned this as well. It's not just having a device with all of the spare parts, but it's also with the technicians and a team that understands how to use it. And so we've been really impressed how they've taken um, a really client-centered approach to training, not just one person in the facility, but anybody who might interact with their machines. So innovations that work and continue to work, I think are the, are the ones that, that really make a difference. A great way to, to summarize it, brilliant, thank you. And um, in terms of as well, when we're, when we're talking about these innovations and when we're talking about good health and well-being, what are we really focusing on? What are the, the goal outcomes of, of these innovations of, or of the developments in this space? Maybe Dr. Abele, we can start with you. Okay. Um, I think it sort of builds on some of what we've said before. So when we think of, of it at those different levels, we can think of when it comes to health outcomes. I think on the one hand, we want to deal with the overall burden of care of, of disease, but we also want to think about reducing the gaps between socioeconomic groups. Um, when it comes to things like the individual and social components of care, it's like, how do we make sure that people who have the highest burden have the tools to improve their health behavior? So I think a good example is also during, actually during COVID, right? So a lot of the guidance around um, dealing with it was like distancing um, and just a lot of behavior change that wasn't necessarily very practical for people that live in say, slums, right? Yeah. So I think a, a lot of the times that we're innovating, really thinking about how, yes, we want to deal with health overall, but we also want to figure out where the burden is and how can we be creative to address um, kind of the challenges faced by people that have the highest burdens. Um, some some a project I worked on around, the, especially the early times when the, um, the pandemic was, when COVID was, um, announced to be a pandemic was really making sure that WHO guidance around 
um, my, um, preventing COVID was available in different African languages, right? Because a lot of the tools, the chatbots, different things, for example, were in English, French. And so how do you make sure that, okay, someone that is living in a village or in the slum or something actually understands what we're saying? So I think those that that's um, looking at kind of the aggregate um, outcomes, but then also looking at where the gaps and biggest burdens are should be um, our goals if we're thinking about leaving no one behind. Brilliant. I think that's a, that's a very relevant example. Um, thank you. A Amy, did you have anything to, to add to that? I really like the idea of thinking about different needs for different types of communities. So thinking mm -hmm. about different languages, et cetera. I think it also helps us to get input from those different types of communities and stakeholders mm -hmm. so that we can understand um, the range of needs and, and make sure we're being responsive. Um, so I think there's... Um, somebody who's living in a, in a rural setting and somebody who's living in a slum might both be left out of most care offerings, um, but they don't necessarily need the same kind of care offering either. So how do we get that full range of perspective as we think about how to meet them where they are? Um, I think the other piece that would be really important is also just noting where a lot of the innovations that we fund in the global health space are headquartered and where the innovations are designed. And a lot of the, um, the prominent um, organizations have headquarters in high income country markets that might be far from the communities that they're trying to serve. And so how can we better center what we're doing and where the, where the leadership is based um, in the actual countries and communities uh, that we are trying to best meet their needs? Um, the, the lived experience, I think, can sometimes get lost in, um, in the different formal funding processes. And so I think encouraging us all to, to think about how to move them more uh, closely to the places where, that, where the activities would take place uh, can be really important. Brilliant, and, and what are the um, ways of achieving this maybe? So in terms of, is it about having people there in these areas that we're um, trying to help and, and getting them more involved? I think that's part of it. It's, it, I think it's engaging communities early and often. Um, mm. So even when we're defining the problem we're trying to tackle, how can we get input from the, the local community on what they would prioritize and what they would care about? And then certainly when we're um, looking at the vetting process that Christopher had mentioned earlier, trying to think about the value proposition, how do we use indicators and metrics that reflect um, the value that may sometimes be hard to see on paper, but is really important in... Um, in ultimate feasibility in, in rolling it out and keeping it working. Back to my my idea of an innovation is something that works and keeps working. Right, and I think that's that's the motto of the panel. Um, great, and, and Christopher, did you have any thoughts on on the goal outcomes and in, in when we're innovating in this space? You're on mute. Oh. No. So as I said, for um, for UNICEF, it's really about improving the equity level of those furthest down. Uh, and for us, it's very much about ensuring that more mothers survive, that more kids are vaccinated, those kind of things, that there's appropriate levels um, of health in, a, in an emergency setting. Um, and, and to speak to some of these matters um, that was brought up, so this aspect of local versus global. So what we realize across the board is that what, what people need in terms of products are very alike across the globe. And sort of in, in creating that balance between having an orientation towards that when it comes to the product, there's very little variance across everything considered in terms of what's needed. However, in the implementation and in the activation of people in order to ensure that that product uh, gets used, that it gets deployed, and it continues to work, uh, as has been said, you need to engage the people. You need to ensure that the right incentives are built in. So when we install the plant in a box, the oxygen plant that we install right now, we know these are complicated products to maintain and service. So ensuring that there's the appropriate engagement at the community in order to continue that happening is, is critical. I just think it's it's important to emphasize that, um, you know, a lot of the strength in the modern world has come from the, the, the globalization and the access to, to, to products that are developed at some places and can be, be rolled out in many places and utilizing the opportunities there are in order to bring prices down, both when looking at the cost of production as well as the cost of transport, not the least in the environment we're in right now. So again, for us, it's really about ensuring access to these um, basic health services, which in turn then ensures that people 
um, have more agency, that people can better drive progress for themselves. It's hard for, for, for people to progress if they don't have the most basic things in order. Um, so, so back to the, the discussion we had in the very uh, in the in the initial part of, of this of this panel here. Um, with these things in order, you can then see people starting to request. You can uh, the, the next level of health services. You can see people start to to explore uh, education to a different level and 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 see where they can um, take their lives to. Brilliant. So it's about kind of giving people the the tools they need to be able to to help themselves in a way. Indeed. Great, great. And when we're talking about these these innovations and, and especially in terms of working on a local level and that kind of thing, what are maybe some of the, the challenges when it comes to the, the implementation and, and kind of quite practically when we're thinking about these innovations? What, yeah, what are maybe some, some challenges that we face? Uh, maybe, Amy, we could start with you. Sure. I was actually just thinking along those lines because I did also want to, to note the hard truth that not every innovation is going to succeed. And we should really take a portfolio approach to innovation. By definition, we are trying something new. We are venturing in a, in a different direction in hopes that it can be transformative. We can't expect that every new venture is going to be successful. That's not true in high income countries. There's no reason we should expect it to be true in global health in uh, low and medium income tr uh, countries as well. And so I think um, just keeping that um, more pragmatic expectation in mind can also be important so that we don't um, overly burden each innovation with thinking that um, we can address the 95% of challenges that Christopher was mentioning just because we have the 5% of the good idea and the, and the product. Um, so with that, that rain on this parade, <laughs> I'll also just speak to some of the challenges um, that I think those innovators and innovations need to overcome as they are trying to become the the part of the portfolio that succeeds. Um, for me, I've really seen that uh, costs, of course, can be an issue, but also inertia and lack of demand. Um, so costs, in any case, when um, a new approach might financially cost more than the status quo, and sometimes the status quo is nothing, um, and so the innovation will be more expensive, that's an important hurdle to get past. And government budgets need to be um, incorporating that, or donors need to find a way to fund that. Um, or there needs to be some uh, business model that allows those costs to be to be met. But also importantly is inertia. There, the current systems in the health system, but also in other ways, um, are designed for the current way of doing things. And so if we're trying to change that, we have to be prepared um, to look at the systemic factors that move um, health service delivery in the, in the current uh, trajectory. And then finally, thinking about demand. Um, I mentioned that um, the V approach to oral prep at the beginning, I think it's so important to understand what could encourage a, uh, the end user, the patient or the client to want to take on a health product or an intervention and not just assume that they will because they should. Um, so how can we make it more appealing for those patients? How can we make it easier and more appealing for their nurses, their doctors, other healthcare providers um, to give them the information and, and the products and services. So the easier we can make it for everybody in the system, the more likely that they will find it interesting and appealing. And then we'll look at our um, clinical indicators as a result of better uptake and then adherence over time. Brilliant, thank you, Amy. And great point about how, unfortunately, it's not just about um, having a great idea. Um, Dr. Abella, are you seeing these same challenges? You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think I'm just going to add, I think there's been a lot of great points made. So I, I think um, in addition to that, I think something that's really important is um, data. People often say that, you know, there's not really a lot of data in emerging economies, but I think being creative about where you get data, if you have a context where most of the cities are in informal, uh, informal settlements, so you might need to look at informal systems to think about how to get data. So I think... Um, being creative about understanding your target audience. Mm. Um, and, and a very practical point, I guess, is also just to, as, um, having a sustainable business model. So for example, if you were to partner with the government to go in with an innovation, it's possible that when um, that current, um, I don't know, that group is out, maybe in four years, you might be back to the scratch. So I think really having a business model that, that you've thought about that's kind of robust enough so that if there's any changes, you might still be able to sustain your solution is also important. 
Brilliant, thank you. Christopher, are you seeing similar similar challenges? Very Asia? much, right. yeah. So we are in the, in the lucky situation that we've got quite a, a number of innovations that are going to scale these years. So the oxygen work, the tents, we have a disability friendly latrines lab, NASD to, to help uh, overcome uh, uh, maternal mortality, women bleeding to death. Um, so quite a number of things. And we are seeing firsthand the issue of implementation. Um, and to sort of go with the metaphor, so the, the anecdotes, I, I like the Edison statement that innovation is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, meaning that you really have to work through these things. Um, in the old days, our mandate was entirely to focus on the supply side, meaning that uh, we were supposed to drive uh, new innovations till they were commercially available, and then we handed them over to operations. And then we realized that this resulted in, in things not really going anywhere time after time. And that that challenge of transitioning from an innovation to a standardized commodity, so a standardized intervention in these uh, environments is extremely complex. And without the attention on that, you will fail. So that aspect of preparing oneself to that, um, having the innovation is having the product, having the solution uh, is really a, a rather small part of the challenge at least many times. Um, uh, and, 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 and powering through that implementation side of things and working with it uh, is pivotal. And you do need to prepare yourself that it's going to be nothing but problems time and time again, no matter how good the innovation is. So I really try internally to emphasize this. You know, we need to anticipate that once we start implementing, the party is only just getting started. And that's where we'll see the real challenges. And we need to understand that unless uh, some of these things that we talked about earlier, that the right incentives are in place, what Amy talked about, that it's not only something that people need, it's also something that they want and therefore demand it. And of course, the whole demand side of things uh, again, keeping in mind that it's uh, extremely resource scarce uh, environments we're operating in. So whatever money is allocated to this intervention is typically taken off from somewhere else. So therefore, you've got to really have a high level of what I call moral integrity in, in what you recommend so that only these interventions are, are recommended to go forward that have the, the right to compete with resources from other areas. Uh, and, and then power through it. Um, I believe there's nothing else um, than, than the ability to deal with all the boring, hard problems you encounter uh, in working your way through these things. I don't know that from a high-level perspective, it's that different from these environments, from other environments. It's at least what I've always seen in the many different innovations I've worked with through my life. Um, so, so what one needs to prepare um, towards is, is just that it's going to be a lot of challenges. Of course, because there's um, unique situations here, the decision processes are often very complex, um, in terms of who funds, who pays, who choose, you need to really work diligently with understanding these things. The regulatory environment, especially deal when dealing with health interventions, can be extremely complex. So there's a lot of homework you need to do all throughout those uh, stages in order to succeed with it coming through. But it is possible. Um, and, and, and if picking the right uh, interventions, as we've seen, uh, you can indeed make a real difference at scale uh, if pushing ahead and approaching it in the right, in the right way. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's very important for our audience to think about all those steps that that come after the idea and, and that come with the implementation. And you've all brought up really valid points. I think another thing that we're, we'd love to discuss is, is um, the role that digital transformation has played in this area and kind of what what maybe trends or, or, or sort of things like that that um, that you've been seeing. Maybe Dr. Abele, if we start with you. Um, I think especially in the past two years, as in the, the COVID years, there's been a lot more money, money going to um, kind of healthcare solutions. So I think that's quite optimistic. I think that digital, particularly digital um, solutions can help to address access barriers. A lot of people started going online to find information, to seek care in, in the context of the lockdown. So I think there's been that huge like change in the norms around seeking care. It can help with um, people that have got maybe barriers in location in accessing care. It can bring down the cost of accessing services. Um, that said, I think it can also create further marginalized groups. For example, if um, I think we've mentioned this a lot as well. So if there's certain groups of people that already have access to, say, the enabling infrastructure to use a digital innovation and we're not thinking about 
people that have a high burden, but maybe cannot capitalize on this digital transformation. So in terms of the risk, I think it's just really understanding the context. And to be honest, I think really to make it work viably in terms of a business model, oftentimes you also need people that are interested in either making those upfront investments that maybe um, cost a bit in, on the, in the beginning, but can help to spur um, kind of changing norms. And you also need a lot of partners to make kind of to make the business model work so that these digital transformations can also be accessible to people that have the highest need for them. Yeah, brilliant. And I think it's it's very valid that you brought up the the risks. And I think that's definitely something that we should be talking about as well. Um, Amy or Christopher, do you have any further thoughts about this or even about the kind of risks that can come with the digital transformation that we're seeing? Yeah, I I also see there's a um, there's certainly an opportunity here, and I think that's really exciting about the digital transformation with a wealth of data. It's more easily um, accessible, more and more um, cell phone access and internet access. I think contributes to that, um, and that allows uh, patients to better understand uh, data about their own health and, and access information um, to inform their care. Um, and also, I see the risk um, for inequity, growing inequities that Dr. Abele was just speaking to. Um, the additional funding um, coming in for COVID-19 purposes is wonderful if it is also used to, well, it's wonderful in any case, because we do have an ongoing pandemic and we need to respond to that. But it can be even more transformative if it's bolstering the overall health systems and thinking about needs um, on the digital and data side beyond just pandemic specific use cases. Um, so if we are bolstering our abilities to have electronic medical records and use them effectively and provide care on other health area and other health areas and health needs, um, I think that that funding and that extra resourcing will go that much further. I think the other form of inequity that we have to be um, watchful for is who is developing the different types of apps, who is, co who is writing the code, um, and what contexts are they writing those for? Um, and is that using data that is more inclusive than, um, than those than populations based in high income countries? Um, are there assumptions that are more inclusive than settings that are um, more in DC and Geneva and, and other high income settings? So I, I would caution that as, a, as another form of inequity um, on the upstream side, as well as um, the downstream um, access to internet and information piece that I, I think Dr. Belli was referencing. The other thing I would just notice is, uh, or I would just note is um, in the digital space, there's a risk of duplicating efforts, especially when there's one health need that's really drawing specific attention. Um, and so we would wanna make sure that we are not repeating um, previous investments and trying to streamline, streamline and make different applications and data systems um, speak to each other as cleanly and efficiently as they can, again, so that providers and patients can get the most use out of that data themselves. Brilliant, brilliant. I think that's a great point to, to bring up. Um, Christopher, what are your thoughts on this? I think many of us innovators uh, are in, in some shape or form ultimately working um, to hope to enable leapfrocking. Um, so the, the best example is countries getting the landline moving directly to the mobile phone. The problem is that these things are so incredibly difficult to predict. Uh, in an innovation space, you often sort of operate under the law of the doubling, um, which is that once things start accelerating, they can accelerate extremely fast, but it is so incredibly difficult to predict that when that is. Like when I was a kid, we had an electric car that was produced in Denmark. Uh, so just as the example of how hard it is to predict when it's actually gonna take off. We all dream of it. We all dream of uh, enabling it to happen. And, and the digital space is in our lifetime, uh, probably um, what, what plays the biggest role in this in so many different ways. Um, and, and this is across the board, right? So digital is going into everything and we're hoping that this uh, in different ways can, can enable this leapfrogging. Um, I, again, uh, think we need to be like, you know, enabling it to happen without being overly optimistic is critical in being able to appropriately uh, operate in this space. So figuring out what we truly have the ability to influence with Amy's point in mind in that we don't want to make hopeless investments uh, in various digital uh, areas that results in, in systems not touring together or in, in investing in this, that or the other app that, that, that might not go anywhere. Um, one of the things we're doing uh, right now, building right now, and have the first version coming live, is to create an, a catalog 
So is the catalog helping countries again to decide which apps to buy rather than being get another developer of apps that we want to sell? Um, so this is supporting countries and making decisions on how systems work together, building on the notion of the, the UNICEF product catalog, uh, adding our critical analysis of which apps are good and not good enough in order to be uh, to be deployed in these environments, which we then hopefully uh, hope will, will uh, enable some of these many uh, amazing uh, innovations that are happening in this space to, uh, to better and, and quicker uh, accelerate their penetration in these environments. That's brilliant. And then hopefully allows for more kind of global cooperation as well. And if I could just quickly add in, I think that catalog is really exciting and it really speaks to um, some of the points I mentioned. And I would be remiss if I did not note our agency's own digital health vision, which outlines exactly these points and these priorities. And so it's wonderful to see this type of collaboration in the the multi, the, um, the donor and the multilateral stakeholder space to enable innovations to arise in the digital data side, but to do so in a way that um, furthers the environment and bolsters um, the overall health system. And if I may add to this, um, so so one of the other themes that are really going again here is this top, you know, top down and, and bottom up uh, approach. And one of the, and as I said, we are working through governments, but that enabling uh, people to themselves uh, request and want the different interventions uh, is pivotal. And digital has the opportunity to do both, right? It has the opportunity to work, um, to, to be deployed within governments to improve systems, but it also very much have that ability uh, to enlighten, educate people on what they can access, what they can do, both in terms of their own health uh, situation, as well as being inspired by what others are doing. And through that request uh, new interventions. And I think uh, the potential of digital to, to improve the agency of people is something that I think is, is just absolutely essential in order to progress health in these moments. Yeah, of course. And uh, Dr. Abele, is this something that you're seeing kind of the importance of, of collaboration in this space? Yes, absolutely. And I think um, I really like the framing around um, kind of looking at innovations as things that work and continue to work. And I think that it's it's really not really it's not possible really without collaborations, especially um, when we're talking about um, populations that have high burden. When we're talking about making sure that we can encourage the agency of um, people, we have to actually know what like what what would um, kind of what they would want, and then how to. Um, oftentimes, we might need to make changes even to to adapt things to particular settings. Um, I also really like the idea. I need to, I think you both need to send me the link to <laughs> your digital health vision and, and the catalog you said, because I really like it. Yes. <laughs> so, so of not like duplicating efforts and really thinking about how we can kind of strengthen what's already going on as well. So absolutely. Great. Well, I will jump in and say I'm happy to send that link. <laughs> and I love the real-time collaboration. I will also shout out that um, a lot of our resources on innovation are available on our website, usa.gov slash CII. <laughs> Brilliant. Keep that in mind, everyone that's, that's working on their pitches over the next few days. That's probably a great place to start. Great. And I'd love to ask you one final question before we move on to the questions that we have from our audience. Um, and I'd like to just ask you if there are, so that we can end on a, a positive note, if there are certain things in this space that you are optimistic about, innovations that you're hopeful about, kind of just looking towards the future. Um, maybe we can start with you, Christopher. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, the amount of things that's happening these years um, and the progression that uh, COVID has has created uh, for innovation um, in, in all its, the harm it's created is, is, is incredible, right? So, so one area that I think uh, we'll see an enormous uh, evolvement within is vaccines. So the, the uh, RNA, uh, RNA technology platform that we've seen evolve uh, and have come to, to fruition through this pandemic is, is just incredible. And then I think um, speaking to some of these uh, things that we brought up so many times in terms of, of local innovation and tech and how tech and, and physical products will converge in various ways. And, and, and Dr. Villa, some of the things you brought up uh, in terms of, of, of the capacity um, of local actors in order to, uh, to, uh, to work with these areas and, 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 and improve their own, their own lives um, by getting better understanding of the situation, I think can, can really also progress things. 
So, so, the, so those are some of the areas that, that we're really paying uh, attention to these years and, and seeing where that can go. Brilliant, thank you. Amy, what are your thoughts? I'm so glad you asked this optimistic question because I know we've been talking about the, how hard it is to move an innovation forward, um, but it is still exciting to try and be bold. And certainly we see many innovations um, rising to the challenge out of, a, out of a broader portfolio. So I would say um, we see innovations in the um, using data in new ways. So citizen contributors um, with the innovator premise that we have supported who can help identify where there are mosquito breeding sites um, and, and make sure that they are removed so that we have less risk of mosquito-borne diseases. Um, we're seeing um, different innovators look at um, even reverse innovation. So Kinos is another innovator that adds a colorant, a blue colorant to disinfectants um, so that a healthcare worker knows when a surface is fully disinfected and then it uh, fades um, when it's, uh, once it's fully set. Um, and that was developed um, with, uh, with our support for low and middle income country settings, but is also now in use in the New York subway um, and recently became a finalist in their own challenge as they were responding to COVID um, disinfectant needs. Um, I also was thinking about the World Mosquito Program and how um, they are working with mosquitoes to, um, that have the Wolbachia bacteria um, to help reduce uh, mosquito populations that can carry uh, Zika and dengue. Um, and that has uh, really taken off in, and really demonstrated scale in, in different ways. And then maybe just one more to note is Jacaranda, an, another innovator that we've supported in Kenya um, that focuses on improving the quality of care for um, mothers, um, pregnant women as they're about to give birth. So all the way from antenatal care through postpartum and all the way to childhood vaccinations for the, the baby after, um, after it arrives. And I think this holistic approach, providing support with um, a steady stream of nurses, uh, but also medical records that can follow the mother in her journey, um, along with SMS texting and other types of support outside of the clinic has been really um, important and impactful and has improved the quality of care there. And has also been shown to um, reduce complications relative to peer hospitals. So this is a, a wide array of different types of innovations from coloring disinfectants to citizen contributors operating on their data phones to, to remove mosquito breeding sites to maternity care hospitals. But I think they speak to the vitality and possibility in innovations, global health, how important they are and um, how we need to keep investing in them because the current tools we have alone will not be enough to reach the SDGs. And we're going to need new ideas and fresh voices um, to, to add to that space. Brilliant, thank you. And what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of examples of things to be hopeful about, so that's that's good. Um, Dr. Bella, I'd love to hear what you're optimistic about. Absolutely, I, I actually am very optimistic about the role, considering all the challenges we talked about. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really optimistic about the role that innovation can play to address health and well-being, especially in emerging economies, because you just find that. The, sometimes the, the policy infrastructure is also not very, very strong. The healthcare system is not always like the targets aren't always met. And a lot of creative ideas come from unexpected places. So when we look at the context of COVID, they had a lot of public private partnerships to improve access to mobile testing for um, COVID. You had um, um, scientists in, I think it was Senegal, come up with like really low cost COVID tests. Um, uh, you've also seen COVID spurring more of a focus on kind of what we earlier talked about, health promoting environments, that health isn't just about the last kind of when the person is very sick and about to die. Like health is also about where they live, whether or not they breathe clean air, whether or not they have access to green spaces. So a project um, I recently worked around kind of looking at implementation research around was seeing how to um, provide more information on access to spaces for physical activity for children with disabilities because they tend to have worse chronic disease outcomes. Um, I also, I'm also really um, enthusiastic about innovations that look at um, affordability. So there's a solution I saw um, in, it's in Nigeria and it's called MDAS and I really like their model because they use a leasing model to kind of bring down the cost and it's digitally, digitally enabled. So they try to bring down the cost of accessing diagnostic services. And I, I think you don't always kind of see those solutions that work with um, 
healthcare providers. So I really like that. I also like innovations that look more at that portfolio, um, 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 kind of have that portfolio model that some of my colleagues have already mentioned. So um, ecosystem innovations, one that comes to mind is um, one called, um, I think it was called the Green Villages in Rwanda. I think it was a partnership between their government and UNDP. I really liked it because they focused on kind of building um, community skills to improve the agricultural production, to address nutrition, rainwater harvesting, um, creating sustainable sources of energy to replace um, kind of um, firewood to address chronic respiratory conditions and also providing a source of income. So I like those innovations that kind of think of the different levers we need to create sustainable improve, improvements in health long term as well. Great, great. And we now have a couple questions from um, the audience. So I'd like to go to those quickly with our last few minutes. Um, the first question that we've got is, is asking, how do you effectively measure health to then take action? And I will leave that to whoever would like to take it. I guess. Um, oh, no. OK, um, I think we can think of it in many ways. So I think you want to look at, you know, whether it's a, a particular diseases, you want to look, you want to look at diseases, you, you might want to look at, so you might start with death, right? What is the death? You, you want to look at having a disease. You want to also look at a lot of the kind of the precursors or the behavioral risk factors. So let's say we're addressing diabetes. You want to look at how people are dying of diabetes. Where is this burden the highest? But also look at the risk factors, like, okay, do people have access to care? And then do people, you know, exercise, diet? So I think looking at those, um, looking at the disease, looking at the burden, where the burden is, looking at the risk factors is a good way to start looking at how, um, kind of defining the, the scope of the problem. And I would agree with all of that. I definitely would leave it to the clinician to, to specify the metrics, just as Dr. Abeli was speaking to. And then I would also add on when we're looking at health innovations, um, what is the track record? Um, how, have, how has the innovation been able to demonstrate that it's feasible, to show that it works in one place and then hopefully more than that? Um, how has it built up its own organizational capabilities to extend further? What partnerships does it have, et cetera? And I'll quickly just plug our innovation index um, to note that health innovations can be very different, but we can still have common parameters to assess how they are advancing and therefore which ones are, are more likely to scale in the near term. Um, so I would encourage anyone who's interested in looking more at those scaling metrics and details to, to check that out on our website as well. Thanks. Brilliant, really helpful to have uh, direct resources. Um, so our next question is around how the future of tech and healthcare or with the future of tech tech and healthcare, how will the patient journey, journey change? And maybe Christopher, you'd like to take this one? Yes. Um, again, there's different ways of answering this question. So with my venture capital hat on, uh, experiencing some of the innovations that's coming on to maybe middle income environments, um, you're seeing how um, much will be able to done online, how much will be done from home, the the experiences you're seeing in, in, in mobile health, uh, e-health is just incredible. Um, and from that perspective, the, the request of the, 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 the patient or the individual um, for, for health will, will change dramatically. Whereas in the environments where UNICEF is working, um, it's still very much about getting people uh, into the, the basic facilities, ensuring that they have access uh, to appropriate care from the, the healthcare worker in the community at first and then bringing them up the levels, ensuring that they seek the health at the appropriate level. Um, so I think there, um, um, the, 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 the key change that we'll see again is how people will, through tech, demand care. And then uh, by how we, uh, uh, via driving implementation of innovations, um, like for example, around oxygen that we've talked about here today, can bring uh, higher levels of, of care further down to uh, the levels uh, in these environments. So for example, equip uh, facilities with oxygen to be the plant in a box or, or some of the other things that we've talked about. Thank you. And um, Amy or Dr. Berry, do you have anything to add? I would add that I think it's really exciting how tech um, can be complementary to bricks and mortar these days. And we've seen that with the during the COVID pandemic with the rise of telehealth and information um, on health online. And I think COVID is not going to be our last shock to the global health system, whether it's another um, disease-based shock like a pandemic or it's a flood or an earthquake or a heat wave as 
we continue to see climate, uh, climate change effects and consequences, we need health systems that are more versatile and resilient than ever. And I think technology can be a, a key aspect of how we build that resiliency. Sometimes we will need the bricks and mortar of physical clinics, and sometimes we will need um, the virtual ways of accessing uh, clinical care. Um, and I think both are complementary and, um, and just help the overall health system be more resilient to whatever shock is coming next. So I don't see technology as um, the sole solution, but I see it as part of the solution and we should welcome it as um, part of built-in res resilience and redundancy that we actually need so that patients can access care in many different ways uh, because we don't know which shock is coming next that will disrupt one of the approaches that we might rely on today. Of course, of course. And Dr. Abele, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, in addition to that, I, I, first of all, I really like that perspective of seeing technology as building resilience, um, especially, yes, because there'll be, there are many more anticipated shocks to health systems. Um, I would also add, um, especially in the behavioral health um, part, I think that personalization is something that will continue. Um, I was just thinking about how in December, my Spotify gave me like the Spotify rap thing and it told me like, you know, the music I was listening to, and it was so cool. Like I wanted to share it. And then I saw that Duolingo was doing the same thing. And I think that this trend is something that we will also be seeing around just improving people's agency and allowing them to tailor their, their changes, especially behavioral health changes to their data and their lifestyles. But also um, there's a huge, um, a lot of burdens of diseases are not just kind of at that individual level. So talking about climate change, talking about rapid urbanization where people are living in cities where there's so many risks to their health. I think there's also the opportunity for technology to kind of empower people to understand the, con the environments they are living in. So for example, around um, um, there's a lot of talk around low cost sensors and how they can allow people to kind of monitor risks in their environments and potentially empower people to also um, navigate, you know, the, their, talk to their decision makers around um, kind of improving the, the risk factors around them in their environments as well. So I think really the aspect of personalization and agency um, is a big opportunity for technology. Yeah, I think that will definitely play a really large part in, um, in the future. Um, I have one last question. And actually, Christopher, this is um, specific for you. So you've been asked, which are the channels through which startups can have access to UNICEF to present their solutions? And which kind of support does UNICEF have in place for startups? Um, yeah, so there is uh, an email in uh, and there are various efforts going on throughout UNICEF. So there is a what we call the UNICEF Venture Capital Fund that can provide support uh, for various tech interventions. From a product perspective, we have our priorities listed on our website. So if you go in and search UNICEF and target product profile, you'll see the areas we've got out in terms of the current priorities we have um, and the way we work with product innovation specifically is that we don't fund uh, any innovations directly. We strictly work by providing the incentive in terms of the opportunity to sell into UNICEF down the line and um, utilizing various tools in order to get there. Um, and we try to really always take a need-driven approach where we, um, along the lines of the discussions we've had, respect that there's many, many ideas, there's many, many technologies out there, and we are starting with an emphasis on looking at what, what is the need, the unmet need in the environment, and then communicate that out into the world to see how many different interventions could, could exist out there uh, to work with. So I'd encourage you, if you have a product innovation, to go in and look at these TPPs to see whether there's a match. And if there is, um, we are highly interested in, uh, in hearing about it. Uh, and, and then you can also look into these different other sources there are for support for, for, uh, for different things. Brilliant. I think our startups in the audience will be really interested to know that. Um, so that's all the time that we have. So I'd like to thank all three of you for your time today and for uh, joining me in this discussion. I think it's been a very holistic and practical, um, yet optimistic discussion around good health and well-being and, and the future. So thank you all for your thoughts and your insight. I think that's been really, really helpful and for our audience as well.